a hybrid between Ascola Mida Arnold. It's a pretty interesting project from the perspective of an animator because we've got uh, four really distinct challenges on the show. Mommy. We have Teddy who has to match exactly the Stan Winston animatronic bear on the set. Ask Dr. No, there's nothing I don't. We have Dr. No who's kind of classically cartoonish without any real limits because he's a hologram and he can do whatever we want him to do. And then we have the beings themselves at the end of the film. Very difficult to animate because they're very sculptural and the minute you start to move them, you have to be very careful. David. Then we have the blue fairy and she's human looking, but completely unreal. She's probably one of the most challenging performance problems we have on the show. So those four things are very different from one another and uh, they make the project very interesting for us. the biggest challenge with Teddy. It's two things. It's how he physically moves has to mimic, in some ways, the animatronic bear. What do we do? We run now. But since we're doing shots that were impossible for the animatronic bear, we have to take it a little bit further. But we always have to maintain that sense of, of him being a mechanical toy. I am not a toy. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is the acting part of it, if you will. I mean, what is Teddy thinking? How does he fit into this world? David's a very sophisticated robot, but Teddy is also a robot, but not as sophisticated. <laughs> that's a tricky thing, because he's, he's written as a full character. He has dialogue, he interacts with the actors, and yet somehow you have to maintain a distance with him that he's really a mechanical creation in their world and a, and a toy. That was the main challenge with him, I think, overall. I looked at a lot of teddy bears when we were first starting this. I would wander into toy shops, which I spent a lot of time in toy shops anyways, but, uh, and I looked at a lot of teddy bears, but there really isn't anything that does what teddy does yet. I think we're very close to having some walking bipedal toys very soon beyond just, you know, tin wind-ups and things, but things that actually walk, but it isn't there yet. So we had to just kind of look at it and just decide from his physiology, you know, how his legs are set apart, how long they are, how tubby he is, and just sort of look at that and say, well, how, you know, how would he walk? How is, what's gonna look cute on him? I did a walk cycle very early on before the Winston fellows had finished their bear. And so that walk cycle was a bit of inspiration that Stephen could take to them and say, this is kind of how the bear should walk. And then they did their best to sort of match that in the shots that they did. And they came up with lots of stuff. And then we took the stuff that they've done now in, in our shots and have kind of worked that in certain idiosyncrasies of the way the bear moves, the way his joints work, the way, uh, the kinds of things he's capable of doing and not capable of doing. We could take all that and fold it into our bear. And we end up with hopefully something that's a, a credible little mechanical bear that you know people will believe in. I went down for the recording of Robin Williams with Stephen. Welcome to Dr. No. And that was the beginning of, of really figuring out what the character, how he should move, what his facial expressions might be like. And Robin had did all kinds of great stuff that we videotaped that was not necessarily directly copied, but was all very inspirational in creating the animation of the character. And then the character itself up here went through further art direction and design stages from the production artwork that we received. And then when the shots went into production, we would take the audio. Question me, you pay the fee. Two for five, you get one free. And uh, I would, you know, talk over the shots with the animators and they would just come up with the business. Just uh, really mannerisms for Dr. No that are fun and uh, that just make him interesting to look at. I looked at ballet dancers to begin with for just examples of graceful movement, very controlled movement. Then uh, also one thing that Dennis Murin suggested would be to look at actors who have a very quiet presence, for instance, Alec Guinness. So we looked at some scenes with Alec Guinness acting where he is presenting dialogue, but it's, it's very internal. He's not waving his hands around a lot. It's very quiet, but there's a lot of strength in it. Give him what he wants. And given that the voice of the specialist was Ben Kingsley, he was also good reference. We searched around that way to find uh, examples of physical acting, physicality that 
that was contained and elegant and graceful, but with a kind of gravity to it. Because there's a long dialogue sequence between the specialist and David, and it's hard to sustain an animated character that long who doesn't have any eyes. I mean, he doesn't have normal human facial expressions, I should say. He doesn't have eyebrows and all the things that make it much easier to register little subtle changes in you know, inflection and so forth. So we had to do it all through pantomime, essentially, with this character. Human beings had created a million explanations of the meaning of life in art, in poetry, in mathematical formulas. Certainly human beings must be the key to the meaning of existence. I think the animators did a great job in trying to emote the, the character, um, just using body language and things. And they studied a lot of tapes and listened to the voice and exactly how um, Ben Kingsley and how he, he moves and how he acts. The actual face itself was an ongoing discussion for many, many months trying to figure out exactly the look that Stephen would go for. And, and I think he was certainly unsure of exactly what he wanted and didn't, you know, it was one of those give me something and let's have a look at it and see if, you know, if we like it. And we eventually um, ended up with this mask look to give it some semblance of humanity of, of, of a person, but wanting it still to have that bridge between you know, the organic and the mechanical. The Blue Fairy is one of the hardest things we're doing in that Physically, she's very realistic. Her proportions are exactly like a real woman's. Um, and yet, in terms of the coloring and the, the lighting in the scene, and she's very sort of ethereal, and we don't exactly know what she's made of or how she was created. And what is your wish? Please make me a real boy. We didn't want to simply have, for instance, an actress in makeup, or to use motion capture to capture a live person's performance and apply it to the model because both of those things would just be completely naturalistic and too grounded in the real world, ultimately. And we wanted something much more stylized, much more, well, like, like fairy-like in, in a sense. I mean, she is an icon in a sense. And the way she holds her hands and reaches out to David and so forth, it's very reminiscent of, uh, for instance, Statues of Mary. As far as her facial movement and just her whole attitude and, and that, it's really coming from, from the design of the statue itself. David, she can never come home. It's a very emotional scene. I mean, David's heart is right there, and um, she's got to be something that the audience is going to buy. So it's very difficult for us and um, she's really an amazing character. She's beautiful, and it's just a pleasure to work on. Your wish is my command. 